Okay, well, I hope this works. Can you hear me? Okay, I hope so. So, uh, unfortunately, John used all my best stuff already, so I, <laughs> my arsenal is empty. Uh, it feels very awkward to begin a lecture on Columbus architects, uh, architecture to a lot of Columbus architects, because I, it's not my expertise, really. I don't know much about it. I would never have done it. Uh, I don't want to do it. <laughs> but uh, the AIA was uh, cagey enough to send John to ask me, because uh, A, that sort of hangdog look, and secondly, we, he's done so much for the school for so little reward <laughs> that I just felt obligated. <clears throat> so uh, it's not my expertise, not my field, but I'm, I'm happy to do it really because of John. Also, uh, well, I have to say also the AIA, the school and the AIA has a fairly uh, parasitic relationship. I, I won't say which to what. <clears throat> But, but clearly the school could not function without the AIA. We're incredibly in debt uh, to you guys. Uh, okay, so this uh, is actually a bit disjointed. The topic is rather broad. It's really four lectures. I'm gonna feel quite easy to jump from one to the other with very little notice. Um, I also have no idea how long this will be. I think the <laughs> <laughs> I do know the best stuff is at the end. <laughs> So if people are leaving really in droves, I, will, I might jump a bit. So this might be a bit, a bit of a ride. So anyway, uh, greetings from Columbus. <clears throat> Here we are. And it's interesting that the, uh, the, even the postcard unites the idea of Columbus with the architecture of Columbus. There's, this, there's a lot of variety. We've got pointy things. We've got dams. We've got all kinds of stuff. And there's so much that you can say it lots of different ways. <laughs> So clearly Columbus has something to give. Columbus, just the name itself. Columbus, Ohio. Oh. <laughs> well. Uh oh. <laughs> huh. City of power and progress. Oh, Nebraska's got, that's too bad. We could have used that. <laughs> I don't know what our motto is, really. Uh, oh, boy. Huh. Not even a, not even a city. So uh, clearly the name is sort of an embarrassment. <laughs> How many of the other top 20 cities you name you have to put the state because they don't know where you're flying to? <clears throat> so uh, this is very embarrassing, very awkward. <sighs> and add an embarrassment of this one. <laughs> this turns out to be the one that actually has the architecture. <clears throat> We're not talking about that tonight. So uh, anyway, uh, Columbus hasn't always been here. In fact, Columbus was never here. Uh, but there was a <laughs> He's as surprised at the name as I am to begin the lecture. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so we arrived here on these virgin shores, our ancestors. And it turns out they're not quite so virgin. There's kind of stuff here already. And uh, some of the stuff is pretty good. So the uh, Serpent Mound, obviously, the uh, Newark Mounds, which I think are just incredible. So uh, we arrived here. There was stuff here, pretty interesting stuff. We saw it, we absorbed, and we improved. This is now the <laughs> Newark Mounds <laughs> uh, with sort of typical central Ohio infrastructure, golf course and tract housing. And the sort of added thrill of riding the cart over the... <laughs> Something you can't, this is very similar to Stonehenge. Something you can't do at Stonehenge, you can't do in Newark. So uh, it's fun to sort of feel the G's as you go over the. <clears throat> and it turns out there's lots of Indian stuff here that we've uh, dealt with. We, Circleville was built around, it, it's actually built on an Indian mound. But that's good Midwestern uh, rational, rational uh, idea about too much free space in the center of town and those darn curves got straightened out. So anyway, we arrived here on the banks of Sayota and established our city. Oh, this is Topeka. Um, <laughs> well, it doesn't actually make much difference. I can tell you, <laughs> it is not as though there's a lot of variety from one American city to another. This, is, could, be, this could be us. <laughs> so uh, 
it's not exactly, exactly the plan. It's not like Savannah or, or Annapolis or Boston. The plan is not particularly interesting, not worth talking about, not much to do with it. So uh, it was established here because of the rivers. We could cross one river, two rivers meet. We could cross them quite easily. <coughs> Unfortunately, Zanesville figured out how to capitalize on this. With the Rye, Rye Bridge, we didn't. So we don't have that going for us. But <coughs> fairly early on, uh, we start applying technology, and there's some pretty interesting things. So this is a, uh, a wooden bridge, central Ohio. There are a number of them. This, I think, is one of the best. The structure is fabulous. Uh, what's interesting, it still engages us. Uh, this is uh, mid-19th uh, mid century, it still engages us. It's a pretty interesting thing. This is a phenomenal experience. Um, uh, seems very architectural, the structure and the space and the program. Um, so the city is founded. We start putting things in it. <clears throat> Hard to find much there. There's not much that survived. It wasn't probably particularly interesting. It was pretty generic. But there are bits. So this is a, uh, a little log cabin. This, I think, is 1806. Um, it's actually two log cabins, because they were actually re reassembled here um, in the uh, university district in a very interesting way. It's really sort of an arts and crafts building, but they're sort of surviving material. Uh, there is um, Adina, the Worthington homestead in Chillicothe, which is quite amazing. It's uh, Latrobe. So this is pretty interesting. So just from the get-go, this is really before, before Columbus even is here, there are people are building houses uh, with a rather substantial architectural ambition. So Latrobe, and I think particularly this one. This is a little house outside of Circleville. Uh, it wasn't designed by Jefferson, but someone essentially stole a Jefferson plan. This is from a pattern book. Um, and it's an amazing house, the way, it's also so typically um, American in the way it sort of starts off Palladio and then says, screw it, and there's other things happening. <laughs> so you can see it's very centralized, uh, and then it starts to wing its way, uh, perhaps into little diagrams, um, starts to set up a certain Palladian idea, and then says, to heck with it. And you can see that that upper left-hand room is kind of exploded, produces another little pavilion out there, creating a little gateway. Uh, the interesting thing is, this is a very sophisticated plan. Obviously, it's Jefferson. Uh, we'll start with very sim uh, familiar. And the reason is, it's essentially the same plan as Alto Summer House or Sullivan's Owatonna Bank. Um, so this is, um, I think, 1830s. So this is, again, pretty interesting that the, uh, from the get-go, one of the things that makes uh, architecture in Columbus, one of the things that motivates it is the house that early commercial architecture, not that interesting, um, fairly generic, but the houses, the money is going to the houses and the in interest in doing the house. And that's something I think we can really build on. I think it's something that uh, really is important to architectural culture, that people, everyone has, has a house, everyone uh, wants to uh, maximize uh, their uh, interest in the house. Arch certainly the idea of architecture in the house is not just something applied elsewhere, applied to other sort of uh, uh, more generic programs. It has to do with the actual idea of living. Uh, obviously, other stuff has to happen. We get a state capital. It becomes a state capital very early, basically because Cleveland and Cincinnati couldn't agree to let the other one be that. We were essentially the third child. <laughs> uh, lots of consequences for this. One is there's really no reason, other than that, there's really no reason that Columbus should be here. So uh, we don't have... <laughs> We don't have the sort of industries. We never had the sort of money. We never had the robber barons that the other cities have. There's still impacts on us. It impacts probably most dramatically in terms of art museum. That there's, there's, there's kind of nothing in it <laughs> compared to, <laughs> certainly compared to Cleveland or even Cincinnati or, or places like Toledo or Dayton. Or they can put up a, they can put up a real uh, run for the money for us. So uh, we're not really, we weren't big league early on. Um, some people think the capital looks sort of funny. Clearly, people in Oregon don't. <laughs> uh, but then um, some pretty interesting buildings started being built here. So the uh, Franklin Co County uh, Courthouse no longer exists, sadly. It was rather amazing, uh, particularly if you look at the, how the tower is composed with those walls just turning into planes and the cupboard can be behind, very sophisticated. That got blitzed. Uh, and being the state capital, there are all sorts of uh, state institutions that Columbus bequeathed that, that might have gone elsewhere had we not been the capital. So the um, deaf school, the blind school, the, 
Asylum for the Insane, um, which was actually here in my lifetime. And I have to admit, this was an incredible building. Ten pavilions stretched out across Hilltop. I think it was, the, it was certainly the largest mental hospital in the country. I think it was actually the largest building in the country at the time it was built. It was absolutely incredible. That got blitzed. <coughs> just too bad. I just saw in the paper the, uh, there's a upstate New York asylum, very similar. It's by Olmsted. It's being renovated as a, as a destination hotel. I think, in fact, if this could just held on for a little longer, the, the view back over the city, the architecture is just spectacular. Also, the grounds, very nice. So that didn't make it. But, it was, but there was stuff here. The prison, some pretty interesting pieces to it. Uh, that didn't make it. Even the prison wall didn't make it. I have to admit, <laughs> I have to admit if you experience Neal Avenue and the parking garage along it, I don't know why this wouldn't be a vast improvement just to have kept the wall rather than the, <laughs> the faux archy thing going on there. So, uh, but anyway, the city did develop, <coughs> became, a, became a city, and there were these sort of nice pieces to it. This is the corner of High and Broad. Um, it looks like, it looks pretty interesting. Uh, continues to develop. There's sort of really nice texture. Levesque Tower is rather amazing. I think Neal House is a very uh, nice hotel. And let's look at this, the street wall that starts to develop sort of big scale stuff. It's really quite nice. Unfortunately, this is mostly gone. <laughs> but there was this moment in time where Columbus really sort of looked like a big league normal city. And uh, there was all the, this incredible activity in the city, which had been true everywhere, not just for Columbus. <clears throat> it's amazing how how much this is not true. Certainly, not, certainly in Columbus it's not true. I mean, getting dinner downtown is quite hard. Um, buying a, anything really is, is, is quite hard. This is just sort of insane. This is sort of, so Columbus has sort of met the, met the uh, same problems as most American cities. It's really quite embarrassing to be American. I mean, it's, you know, I can remember it used to be that uh, if you lived in Toronto, you would, you would go to Buffalo for the weekend. Now the idea is it's, Insane. <laughs> Obviously, anybody in Buffalo would go to Toronto. You could compare Montreal to Boston. It used to be Boston was just much more interesting. Ah, now it's dead. So Montreal completely different. So there's this, so there's a, this, um, the embarrassment that we have about American cities is certainly a problem we have with Columbus. Um, you, we look back in this heyday. If you're old enough to, I mean, the, the, my students have no idea that there was sort of um, this incredible vi vitality. But certainly until about the about the um, mid-1950s, if you wanted something in Columbus, it was downtown. The movie theaters, all the stores downtown. There were a few, you know, you would find a grocery store, a little, um, little community area. But the stuff was downtown. Now it's just really nothing is downtown. But also, you just look at the architecture of that. It was this, this kind of a classic um, uh, American mid-century street wall, really fabulous stuff. Nice mix. Also, the signage, really great. Oops. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, the other th thing is sort of the, the uh, I find like this little slide, this is a little building at the northeast, the northeast corner of Gay and High. What I like about this is, uh, this is a ridiculous site for a building. <laughs> it's about 12 feet wide. But what the heck, it's downtown, it's gonna be a valuable each space, we're gonna put a building on it. So uh, it's sort of, it's sort of out hadex hadex really in terms of the thinness of it. Um, but you would never have given that space up. And you compare that to, to the southwest corner of High and Broad, where they tore a building down, it's just not feasible to put another building there, not, certainly not a five-story building on that site. So there was, what's interesting is you look at these buildings, they sort of testify, yeah, they're really cute, but they also testify to a real um, economic vitality of the city, to, uh, invest in fairly improbable ways. You look at, um, you think of sort of uh, contemporary Tokyo houses on just ridiculous lots. But you look at this, you say, well, this, really, this is a lot more of an investment on a virtually the same lot, and it's happening in Columbus, or happened in Columbus. Uh, <clears throat> there's also some really great architecture here, not just sort of generic stuff, but this is uh, the Burnham building, the uh, Wyandotte, the building I admire very much. I love the base. I love the way it, the rest of it addresses the base. I like the sort of streetscape of it. And I think the basic massing of it, oh, sorry. It's also, <laughs> it's also very nice. I was really happy to have that here. Uh, and again, you look at sort of pictures of Columbus, sort of mid 20th century. It, is a, it seems unrecognizable uh, now in terms of the vitality, the density, the variety uh, that it has, which is not something you associate with the city now. Uh, I, am, I lament all the stuff that used to be here that I find architecturally uh, fascinating, if a bit naive. So uh, there's the um, Keith Theater 
Yeah, I just love the sign. I love the, I love the uh, directionality of the sign, given the lack of the, that in the building. And I think also the cornice is amazing. <laughs> sort of the world of the gratuitous cantilever of the, <laughs> of the Dutch school <clears throat> about 50 years early. So I, it's too bad this isn't here. I'm pretty sure it's a parking lot. Uh, and you look at sort of the, all the volume of buildings uh, some interesting, some not so. I think the uh, hotel on the right is rather amazing. All gone. It doesn't seem, you should wonder one of the economics of that. Is that actually necessary that's been replaced by more stuff? Is it better stuff? I'm not so sure it is, actually. I also think that the, sort of the, um, the, um, well, it's interesting. In the 1920s, there were no parking lots downtown. So all that sort of has happened, the sort of bombed out look is what sort of post 20s because of the car. As you look at all the uh, volume inside the central belt, I think the actual volume of enclosed space architecture is exactly the same as it was 100 years ago. It's just that it's now in towers, a couple of towers, some towers, and the rest is all parking. I'm not sure that trade-off has been good, actually. Uh, there's more stuff that we had, or had. <coughs> this is the uh, station. Uh, again, Burnham, it's a pretty fabulous screen wall. It's interesting because the, the strategy of this is exactly the same as the uh, convention center to put a faux facade on a giant box behind it. Um, <clears throat> so you sort of wonder, since the theme is the way, since it's the same, since the strategy is the same, is it really worth the transformation? So this was this is now gone. Also, I don't have an illustration of it, but how you actually got in, got to the station, and got back was an amazing piece of engineering. Uh, in terms of uh, traffic engineering, which is not something you normally associate with Columbus. Amazing piece of traffic engineering. <laughs> so so, so uh, <clears throat> very early on, they were up to the challenge. Now it becomes a bit more generic. Uh, but you look at other examples, you say, well, this is amazing, the, the double-decker streetcar in front of the State House. So there was a transportation system. There's a great streetcar system, also an interurban system. I would have liked that. Too bad that didn't survive. Um, this is just the interurban system. Cincinnati is in the southwest. Zanesville is to the east. Columbus is in the middle. You could have gone to Cincinnati or Zanesville by interurban, which is sort of very high-speed trolleys um, in the countryside, which I, sounds like a great idea, as opposed to sitting on tra in traffic on 71. That's gone. Um, and you could have gotten access to lots of countryside. So this is, happens to be um, north of Delaware. There's a, there were parks being established because of the interurban to get easy access far outside the city. I think this is a great idea. This is something I can do in London, um, the UK London, <laughs> but not something I can do here. I sort of lament that loss. This is something we had. We no longer have this. I think it's too bad. Would have loved that. Um, and getting access to the country also meant that there were all sorts of amenities I would associate. So this is um, this was Columbus. This was a place, this is along the Olentangy. I could rent a boat, I could get a canoe, I could ride around in a boat, I could get a beer, I could get dinner, I could dance, I could listen to the music under the stars. I wouldn't mind having a place like this now. This is uh, Olentangy Park. Uh, it's now Olentangy Village. This didn't survive the Depression, unfortunately. Uh, that's the music hall. Uh, there, are, there are more buildings. This is another one, also Indi Indianola Park, which is sort of the small cousin. This was at the Indivayuka Ravine between 4th and the railroad. So a great gate gateway. It was actually started off being a um, tennis courts for a housing development for that neighborhood. Uh, it was so popular, people wanted to picnic there, so they took advantage of that, put in a huge pool. Um, great slides. What the velocity which you hit? <laughs> uh, unfortunately, this is also gone. And you also just think, uh, here's, the, here's Columbus. The c climate in the summer is hellish, hot and humid. The idea of having a pool, I'm all for that. I believe there are three public pools in a city of 800,000. It's odd, isn't it? So I think they had a, you look back on this, they had a lot better idea, and they, they just got things done better. So I look at the, I look at the architecture of Columbus, sort of the amenities of it, and I, I lo love this opportunity. It's strange that that's not here any longer. It's strange that there isn't more of this, and even better, as opposed to none of it. Uh, this is the uh, Shoot the Shoots at Indian Little Park. 
I would love to do that. I'd look at the architecture. <laughs> look at the architecture of that at the top. That's an amazing thing. I would, I, would, I, would, I would walk over to see that and spend 30 minutes looking at that thing. I think it's really great. So that's, that's gone. It's been replaced by housing, which is really indifferent. So uh, as we talk about the architecture at Columbus, there's this, a lot of stuff here that both in terms of the sophistication of it or the kookiness of it or its ability to provide programmatic activities in a really interesting way was here and it's gone. Uh, but anyway, the city is coming along and one of the institutions is the university. So this is, um, this is the um, university hall. Uh, the first building uh, built was really a mega building. Everything was in it, all the library, the classrooms, uh, lecture halls, housing. Uh, it's really the tradition of mega buildings in this building. I think the, I think the really fir the, at the time of the revolution, the biggest building in the country was at Princeton. It was Princeton. It was they had one building, Nassau Hall, which everything was there. So I the whole, the whole origin of the mega building uh, uh, really can be traced back to some degree to this country, um, to which of a university function. This would be it for Ohio State. Uh, this is the newer version of it. That uh, it's a bit fake, actually. Uh, when I first got here, it was interesting, there was, uh, used to be a marker on it that actually showed you what the original building looked like. That's now gone, I found out. <laughs> that uh, I, think the, I, think the, I think it's actually very wise the university not to create the comparison for you to make a judgment. <laughs> it seems so obviously deficient. So uh, it's just demolished 71, reconstructed 76. I think we were better off with the one before. Uh, this we, we all know is the armory, which I think is an incredible incredible building, actually. Uh, it's too bad it burned. Actually, what burned was the roof. The rest of it, it took a, quite a while to demolish. So um, it's been, since been reconstructed for the Wexner Center. I have to admit, I prefer this part of that better. I wish it were here. Even as a ruin, I wish it were here. Uh, but there's other stuff. There's Orton Hall. Um, this is a pretty great building. Uh, nice little pieces to it. Uh, sorry about that. We would hard, hard need to show you. I think what's interesting about this, we've all been in this building, what's interesting about it is the lighting, how hellish it is. <laughs> so it's like four different tungsten links, all of which unpleasant. The mess it makes uh, as an aggregate, really sort of too bad. But this is it's also one of the problems with the architecture, that really good architecture requires really good maintenance. Um, and the university um, has beneficially shown architectural students what happens with poor maintenance. <laughs> a lesson worth learning, um, but not such a bad building. Uh, it's uh, Frank Packard. Um, this is the memorial to a beloved teacher. I think this is a really great idea. You don't, <laughs> you don't see much of this. <laughs> so I think we've lost something <laughs> in not having things like this. Obviously, um, Norton would be full of them. This is the column with the death heads. I think you could never get away with this anymore. But kind of fabulous. What a great building in the stone. Oh, sorry about these. Uh, and even things like the uh, University, uh, the um, Faculty Club. I, I really quite admire this sort of scando neoclassical industrio stuff. And uh, obviously the inside's been wrecked. But you look at the, you look at this and say, this is really kind of daring. And you also realize this, you could never get away with this now. So it's not particularly a modern building, not particularly contemporary, but just in terms of the, the, uh, the blankness of the walls, the spareness, the sort of incompleteness of the uh, middle pavilion, uh, you could never get away with this now. And I think it's actually, this is a rather interesting, sensitive um, elevation, not the worst thing in the world. So um, you compare this to, for example, uh, the business school. <laughs> Unless that was done by an AIA member at Columbus, in which case, you compare it favorably. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the university proceeds along, and uh, the most amazing thing happens, that it was originally built, a university would, uh, God forbid you have a university in a city you wanted away from the city you wanted on a hill, so they found a hill in Columbus, which is a miracle. And the original, the original entrance was actually from Neil. And it's subsequent to that, as a, as a city grew and the university grew, they realized this wasn't going to work. Uh, and they invent the oval, and they invent that axis. And this is really, I think, just a huge credit 
to uh, the world of design in Columbus. I think this is an amazing event. And I think it's, it's amazing it still works. It still, still works so well. And also, um, in terms of comparison, it's so embarrassing how poorly everything built in the last 100 years compares to this. You think of West Campus, how much money has been spent across the river just for what, really, in terms of space? Just for what? So we have tons of trees, tons of grass, but the coherent idea of this is just gone. But to the north, we have the little city growing. To the south, we have the villas. There's this interesting match at the oval between the villas and the city, but beyond that, there is the, also the miracle of the South Oval. I love that name. Um, and the, the down to Mirror Lake. I think that is an ensemble of, of, uh, of, a, of an idea of a, of a universe, really, which is also, how many, how many universities do that? I move from the city to the middle landscape to the forest. Um, I have the sort of the universe in toto by doing that. Just a brilliant scheme. Um, and again, we, think we recognize within that lots of other things. This is the figure field of Wiesbaden. It could also be Nancy. There are lots of uh, Rococo towns which are going to do so much, pretty much the same. This interesting schism between the urban and the, and the villa and the garden and that sort of wedding it, finding the middle along the seam but between those two things. So I think the oval is just an amazing thing. And the space, South Oval, uh, the Mirror Lake. Um, it's also to see, you, you get university brochures and see where the images are. They're coming from these landscapes. They're not coming across the river. They're not coming from uh, the river dorms. Uh, so these, these landscapes, people respond to these as really highly desirable, valuable spaces. Um, there's some amazing buildings on campus. This is a little guy, I forget the name of it now. It's next to um, the James Cancer Center, right across from that. Um, it's hard to photograph. This is one, this could easily be in London. This could easily be uh, in Hampstead or Kensington. There's that amazing oculus on that little tower. And you look at these facades, oh, sorry. Um, well, just turn your head, what the hell? And the, the <laughs> look at that facade. Look at the marching stairs down. Look at the, the composition, the freestanding columns that are truncated. The incredible, this is an amazingly sophisticated building. Just the gutter uh, as it sort of marches echeloning down against the grain of the roof behind it. Very sophisticated building. Uh, it's hard to imagine that this is a, there was a time when the university was just cranking this kind of stuff out. This was sort of, um, we go inside, <coughs> something very different. So I think this is something we have to be concerned about, that the, to the university, a building is a facade. Even that's not particularly interesting. To the inside, it means packing out and maxing in, in the most grotesquely minimal way possible. So clearly one's experience of, arch if, this is what architecture is, that one's experience of the space on a day-to-day -day basis is just abysmal. You wonder what the Boslers think. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they think they were rooked. <clears throat> uh, Pomeranian, which you all, you all know, and compare that to, uh, thank heavens they haven't ripped those interiors out or they keep, um, things keep, keep happening. That amazing uh, crofting, those fabulous, uh, very, such, such thin mullions on the steel uh, doors. Really, an amazing space, uh, and the sort of uh, the, the double doors on the corner, sort of competing. You'd never get over this. We don't need two doors. What are you doing? So the, also, yes, one with a step, one not. What's just the constant question? I never, I can never look at this without sort of the questions sort of be thrown at. What the heck is going on here? Who's doing what to whom and with what? It's, this is a very interesting architectural proposition, which is not something you say often about looking at uh, un uh, university buildings. Um, and then back to the city. So, uh, after, so the city is growing. We have the university, the institutions. So uh, whatever else is happening, things are disappearing. But we actually have a collection of really amazing buildings. Again, this is Frank Packard. This is the uh, Toledo and Central Ohio train station. This really, I find mind-blowing. Unbelievably sophisticated. First of all, it's clearly Central European. Not quite sure what it's doing here. So uh, this would be so happy to be a, a train station in Slovakia, um, in a major city. It's just so, so amazing. So uh, what an incredible, um, what an incredible practice he had. So uh, so productive and uh, inventive. He was clearly looking at a lot. He invented a lot, discovering a lot. It was really quite amazing. So I, I, 
you, you say, well, that's all happening back in the uh, you know, 19th, early 20th century. This is really, this has to be good for Columbus to have this sort of a culture here that early on. But I think it's true. Ugh. I'm not quite sure where this is happening. It's okay when I loaded them. <laughs> so um, anyway, so you look at Columbus, we have some really great architecture. We have some really great fabric. So again, this is the corner of high and broad uh, with the old Royals jewelry sign. There's something really, maybe it's just my age. When I look at this, I really like it. I like the, I like the mixture of architecture. I like the exuberance. Of the, I like the clash of uh, sort of high style and commerce. Uh, I like the reality of it. There's sort of the grittiness, but also the refinement, and also the energy of it and the complexity of all of it. Um, we've also inherited uh, some incredible pieces of architecture in terms of the interior. So I think of the theaters. This happens to be the Ohio. There's also the Southern. I should also have the Lincoln, which has been restored recently. I think it's really incredible. And then we also, in, we also have new buildings uh, to sort of complement those old ones. This is obviously the state office tower. This is one of my, I think, by far the best high rise in town. And I love the dichotomy between the south elevation, which is fairly stolid, and the north, which just fragments into a million pieces. And it's interesting you just, if I could go back. You look at this kind of a corner, which sort of shows this sort of jazzy city organization and how this, for whatever reason, and for other reasons as well, kind of embedded in this as it kind of fragments uh, into these, co uh, these core pieces, sort of like a geode unfolding. What a great building this is. Uh, <clears throat> and whatever you think of it, I really like this building. I love the uh, Christopher Inn. First of all, I like the play on Christopher Wren, which I think is really good. <laughs> Uh, and I love the idea you could drive up to your room in virtually the same volume. Also, that the fact that there's a really lovely little garden below this where the pool was. Actually, there's a sunken, pool, there's a sunken garden with a pool. <coughs> I can't believe it really was necessary to tear this down I just, uh, in, a, in a city which is always short of hotel space. So it just amazes at me how, how short a life this had uh, as a piece of architecture. Um, I think it was a pretty nice piece of uh, cityscape, actually. Uh, and the, as the city grows, there's all this sort of inadvertent fabric. And this is one of my favorite pieces. So this, I call this the four churches. This happens to be the three of them. This is South Third, <coughs> where the churches on the uh, east side just march along. This could easily be Bamberg or Hamburg. Both are f f famous. H Hamburg for, their, uh, f the, for the five towers. Bamberg for the three towers. Uh, we have these three towers. There's actually four. Oops. If you don't mind throwing in a dispatch as well uh, with the corner shirts uh, there. So I think that, what an amazing thing. The problem is you can only see this. It's like those classic views of the city you get on postcards. You can only see them by standing on a railroad bridge over the Scioto, sort of death trap in sort of muskrat land. It's sort of, <laughs> that's a bit of a deficiency. It's just a, it would be nice to have some sort of place to see the city or see the glories of the city or the organization of the city or bits of organization unfold other than standing in a traffic line or a uh, yeah, on one of those bridges. So that's something we certainly improve upon. Uh, and I also admire little pieces of uh, architecture which are taking advantage or just finding opportunities where you sort of least expect it. So this is one of my favorite little buildings. It's one of the few really clearly arts and crafts buildings in Columbus. It's the Ringside Cafe on uh, Pearl Street, just north of Broad. What I particularly like about it, uh, the interiors are amazing, but the, um, what I particularly like about it is the fact they've invented a corner which doesn't exist. So that is actually not an alley to the left. It's a loading dock. But they're regarding it as something significant as opposed to an, they're finding an opportunity with that because it clearly gives presence to the corner, I think of Barcelona, it gives presence to the corner. It's an opportunity to give this uh, a, a, a presence in the street uh, and part of the fabric. <laughs> it would be wonderful if, 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 if more could happen to the uh, alleys to encourage this. Especially, you see on the Pearl Alley, there are all sorts of activities, that great little Venezuelan restaurant. It just seems too bad uh, one of the great things about Columbus, which is completely accidental, is there are actually two cities superimposed on each other. There's the city of the big streets and the city of the little streets, sort of on a double grid, the little streets being the alleys. And in fact, a lot of the alleys have names, and there's no reason why they couldn't have been. And in fact, if you look at the block structure of Columbus, it's about 400 feet square. Portland, Seattle, and to some degree San Francisco, they're about 200 feet square. So it's like, say, which also gives you twice as much of storefront as twice as much of uh, walkable space. So we're stuck with the grid, but in fact, 
The idea I could move from a big city to a little city by going down a street and sort of move to the little city, then pop back up to the big city and move to that would be a wonderful thing. So, uh, and it's not as though you, people in Portland and, or, and uh, Seattle say, you know, it would really be a lot better if half the streets downtown were turned into alleys. <coughs> so we've essentially done that by sort of being uh, ignoring them and neglecting them. So there are, you look at Columbus, there are incredible opportunities, well, not incredible, a bit of exaggeration, but there are opportunities. <laughs> Yes, it's even worse because they're quite credible opportunities uh, that we're not taking advantage of, that, there are, there are, uh, that could make the city a lot better uh, without that much effort. There's already the structure there that could just be used better. Um, I like Schmitz. <coughs> I like Schmitz because it takes advantage of the little anomaly of the uh, street grid uh, to become an end uh, element. You'll even look at that little, um, whatever it's called, little sh black forest shrine thing. It's in the wrong position on the building to accommodate the street correctly. So uh, I love that little piazza. I'm glad there are little buildings around it to uh, reinforce the sort of commercial nature of it. I wish that happened more often. Uh, there are other opportunities downtown for it to happen. It's not happening, but there, it could have. And I also like uh, bits of survival. I wish there were more of it, of the sort of just 19th century um, um, uh, storefronts. A, because I'd just like to have a more of a mix, but B, <coughs> I would like to see more storefronts that aren't just anodized aluminum stuck on the front of things for a mile. I just, this is, um, so this has survived. One of the great things about London or other, um, Prague is you, there are tons of this. I wish more of it survived, uh, but at least there's some of it there. But it also starts, it tells us something about the future that uh, there are lots of opportunities for variety and invention on a small scale uh, for architecture. It doesn't have to be at a big scale to have some sort of impact on the city and on the streetscape. Um, I like this sign. <clears throat> I think it adds to the, God knows what happened to the dispatch, it's probably going down the toilet. And I have no idea what a home newspaper is, if you think about it. <laughs> but I just like the sign, I like what it does to the city, as opposed to, for example, the jumbotron at the arena district, which I find so annoying. First of all, the idea that looking at kind of a huge television is interesting. <laughs> I think that day has passed. Also this <laughs> hideous colors. And then to add insult with injury, two other things. One is there's always this god-awful noise that's being broadcast, but it's not clear to me what it is. is it belongs to the jumbotron or not, not particularly clear. And also the lighting, which is hideous. The sort of Bergen-Belsen memorial lighting for that space. It just makes you not want to occupy it. Uh, so it's, I look at this sort of lighting. I mean, you just can't beat neon. It also can't beat, sadly, incandescent lighting. Uh, I just wish they could get the, the uh, wavelengths better on the LED stuff. Uh, there's some real treasures here. I think St. Stephen's Church, I won't go into a lot. I think this is a really fabulous building, fabulous complex. <coughs> uh, but also, I mean, it's a lot of these buildings, I think St. Uh, Stephen's is particularly true. You look at this, there are lots of new churches in Columbus in the suburbs. They're not, other than those designed by AA members, <laughs> 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 they're not particularly good. Um, so, uh, and you, sort of, you sort of wonder what, Something seems to have happened to the architecture, not just in Columbus, but in general, it's reflected in architecture in Columbus, where architecture becomes, you look at the Packard stuff, so he's accommodating people who have a very generic program, he's accommodating in a very specific way with a lot of invention, uh, uh, it's quite exciting, still exciting now. Uh, whereas a lot of stuff is sort of being, it's accommodated in kind of a generic way, it's familiar, we've seen it before, it could be Duluth, it could be Des Moines, it could be Davenport, it happens to be Columbus, it's sort of boring. So. This is but sort of the trajectory, I think it's especially true in this country where architecture is becoming sort of a service industry to allow the expected to be made possible. But I think as, a, as an intellectual activity, making possible the expected doesn't sound that interesting, actually. So the one thing I love about the St. Stephen's Church is this is really an amazing little building. You wonder about the client, whether they realize that, we're pushing for it, I doubt it. I think it was just the architect said, these things are possible. Uh, well, we're taking a look at. <coughs> I love that glass block wall. I love it at night when it glows. I love the shadows coming on it. Just millions of nice things. And there's also, uh, so this, we're now up to post-war. Uh, this is, uh, there's housing that's coming along. There's pretty interesting housing happening. This is Rush Creek Village. I think the sum is better than the individual parts. But this is not nothing. The little tower house is my particular favorite. You think, well, this is just, this is something that could be happening anywhere. So housing is being produced. It's not complete embarrassing. 
it seems kind of okay, some interesting moments to it. Um, but certainly after the war, you know, the next 50 years, 60 years, you'd expect to see a lot more of this. Well, it does not happen. This is, oh, it's either the gas company or the electric company, I can't remember which. This is the, the idea that either one of them would build a house, house of the future, as a demonstration. It's kind of a really nice idea. I can't imagine that happening now. They're not that interested in that. But, uh, Clearly, there was this optimism about the future uh, and about things that could happen in the future. So this is the, I think, of the Lustron homes, which there are some in Columbus. I think they're in 36 states. But they were actually built here. The factory was here. Uh, it's the old Curtis Wright factory. It was uh, recommissioned after the war to produce these things. Too bad it didn't quite work out. Because I think this would be kind of a really great idea. These houses were about 25% cheaper. They work pretty well. I would love to have a fairly low-maintenance house turquoise. Uh, and here's the house coming <clears throat> to the, so I think it also be, you look at the way things are building, especially, especially housing, I just can't believe this wouldn't be a better idea, really. So it's not, there was a trajectory that was taken, I think really was the wrong trajectory, and the housing we get now is very different from this. <coughs> if the other was the gas company, this is the electric, or vice versa, this is the other house of the future, and unfortunately, this turned out to be true. <laughs> so this little, little Cotswold reverie, became the, uh, the idea. It, sort of, it just seems strange that this, was, this, this happened. You think of the 20th century, you know, the Depression, the war, coming out of it, this incredible optimism. Why would the focus be on this? So uh, I'm not so sure that it actually had to be, but clearly the, the way housing was being built changed. It became not a series of small builders on small parcels, but it became quite large and uh, industrialized. There used to be hundreds of house builders in Columbus. Now there are really five or four. Not very, they'll do, they'll do thousands of houses. So the whole way houses get built, and I think this has really hurt architecture um, uh, for lots of reasons. Not just that we're not getting commissioned to design these, but really because people experience architecture through their houses. The experience of architecture through their house is now essentially MI, or the equivalent. It's a fairly banal, fairly dumb, uh, fairly unpleasant, and fairly impermanent um, thing. Uh, so that the whole, and then as a result of that, the connection people have to architecture is something that's really quite remote. It's something that's applied to something else far away somewhere. But it's not something, it's not about space, it's not about life, it's not about accommodation, and it's not about community and making a better world. Um, <clears throat> even within that vocabulary, there were other things happening. So Sessions Village, which I think is pretty incredible. Why this did not become the model for Columbus, I couldn't tell you. I assume it's such a brilliant idea very dense. This is, this is essentially London density, which can support rapid transit, among other things, uh, with also incredible uh, interest. These little moments, look at the town square, uh, very small lots, very small gardens, but communally they add up. Again, this, um, they're, they're providing an environment, I think unlike Rush Creek, this is providing an environment which is rather spectacular, that everyone benefits by the juxtaposition of their houses uh, with the others. Uh, but something happens, <clears throat> so clearly part of it is that's the car, and part of it is the change of how houses are produced, and the city changes very dramatically. Uh, and this becomes the future, which I think would be quite surprising to the beginning of the 20th century. Um, so this is the house, this is now the Columbus house, it's of no interest, the landscape it in is hellish, this I think is Dublin, which I believe is to be desirable, <coughs> could be... <laughs> Looks like Hilliard to me. <coughs> I don't know what the cues are that would indicate the difference. Uh, and this is now the house that everyone lives in. But actually, not just everyone. This is the house that architects live in. We did a, that'd be very interesting for the AIA to do, to do a little <coughs> pin-up board of where you live. It would be this. We live in Hilliard. Uh, and we do it for the schools. We do it because it's expected. We do it for the norm. I think it's really, this is really the coup de grace for the profession, that not only does the, the way they're normally produced has been eliminated, so the people are no longer involved with houses or opportunities for houses, but in fact, even architects aren't. So the one, the one component of the community which should be out there making things happen isn't. I think it's especially too bad in Columbus, which has a very, compared to other cities, a very low cost of land and housing and a very high, uh, uh, level of per capita income. This seems to be the one place that could happen. But I have to say there's another problem. I don't think this is here yet. 
And that has to do with inner cities, so that uh, you just love the villages, don't you? <laughs> German village, Victorian village, Italian village. <clears throat> well, where an Italian village, actually? Because most 60% of it's not there. So, so the, yes, not, not that we shouldn't keep things which are great, not that I'm not concerned about streetscape and community, that seems fine with me, but one of the problems is at a certain point, it becomes really uh, the enemy of the future. So uh, this happens to be a new house. <clears throat> this happens to be in Hampstead in London, which is one of the most strictly design-controlled communities uh, in England. A lot more weapons uh, for control than in this country, and this is allowed. So uh, the interesting thing is there, the law does not prevent new architecture. It just has to be good. So there's actually, you could try Googling that. It might, I think you might get it. <laughs> There are lots of very contemporary houses in Hampstead, and that's fine. They say this is a good idea. Whereas in Columbus, <coughs> this is, it cannot happen because of the boards. <laughs> uh, usually our students, I have to say, are preventing it from happening. So, so, so you, don't get good, you don't get modern architecture. You don't get good modern architecture, which would be really fabulous. And you get really, you don't get old architecture, you can't do that, but you actually get really crappy old architecture imitating really bad housing. <coughs> so this is a huge, uh, it's, a, it's a real problem for the city, but it's a huge problem for architecture, where, where if this market were simply available, um, I, I, I imagine most of you, certainly the faculty, would love to live, I would love to live in this thing, or something, I'd, I'd rather design it, <laughs> uh, in one of the villages. So, uh, and the other problem is that the future villages won't be, uh, uh, Italian or German or Victorian villages, they will be the villages of the crap we're building now, which I will call Erzatz village. Um, <coughs> but increasingly, Columbus is being built to provide fodder for Erzatz village. But Erzatz village seems, it, the stuff has never been good, it won't be good in the future, but it is kind of um, historically familiar. I think people would, be, would love to have uh, something other than this. I think it, was, it should be a model for this. So I, I um, I think this, all of us, it was all of us to put pressure on the school, pressure, pressure on the city, and pressure on the communities to simply provide better accommodation for modern architecture in the city for people who want to live in the city. <coughs> Hampstead, modern architecture, Hampstead. Not exactly Georgian. One thing that's worth looking at, um, so we think, of, we think of L.A. We think, well, here we are in Columbus, but there's L.A. We think of L.A. We think, wow, turn of the century, 1900, things are really taking off. All that great housing. We think of uh, Green and Green. We think of the Gamble House. Interesting thing, the Green and Green brothers, they're from Ohio. We think of the Gambles, they're from Ohio. Uh, so it's not as though it couldn't happen here. So, well, that was L.A. They're a lot bigger. Uh, L.A. in 1900 had a population substantially smaller than at Columbus, a metropolitan area incredibly smaller than Columbus. The same thing is not exactly happening here. We have Frank Packard. There is stuff happening here, but we don't have the, we don't have the Green Brothers. So uh, and you look at then, uh, you look at Columbus now compared to L.A. then. So you look at L.A. at the turn of the century, lots of stuff happening at Columbus now. In terms of housing particularly, we are way short of lots of really great houses in this city. We should have hundreds and hundreds of green and green quality houses being built here. So I think the reason is that because of uh, the change in um, development, that in fact you can't buy a lot because it, they're done in thousand acre bulk just for MI, you can't buy a lot inside an MI development or the equivalent, and you can't get anywhere near the villages. And anything is likely to become a village in the blink of an eye, <coughs> turns out. So I think this is a huge problem, uh, that there's a there's sort of deficit of architecture, and this is the sort of architecture and housing that really allows us to connect with the public. So the, the, the whole AIA um, uh, interest in getting the public involved in architecture, I think, couldn't be better, but I think we're missing a huge opportunity, which is housing. If you ever look at those god-awful magazines, Columbus Monthly, or any of those things, there's this always, always housing. It's 50% housing. It's always horrible. <clears throat> I think people must realize it's horrible. They must get dwell. They must use the other alternatives. They must go to Hampstead. Another interesting statistic. <laughs> All I can say is I look at this and say, you know, it's too bad the architects, you guys should get organized. You should get some sort of, 
You should get some sort of interest group to protect your interests. <coughs> I think the sort of the dispersal, I love the car as much as anyone, but I think the dispersal and to sort of sprawl is another reason architecture doesn't happen. So architecture becomes a matter of parking and putting a box, sort of expected box somewhere. Uh, I wish we had some sort of way of getting around uh, other than driving. Also, it's like driving is being harder and harder and harder. I don't drive that much, but you, you ever hit the suburbs for some horrible reason, you just think this is unbelievably bad. Um, I wish we could have something like Calgary, uh, which is the rapid, this is the rapid transit system in Calgary. We say, oh well, that's a very different sort of a city. <coughs> Almost exactly the same population, it's actually slightly smaller, uh, and, and uh, about 20% not as rich. So what, one of the things about this town, which sounds we don't have money, but we're not putting money into stuff which is gonna be, build us a better community, or provide certainly better opportunities for architecture, uh, or also much of a future, I have to say. So that's the problem. You say, well, that's Canada. This is the Denver metro system, half built, half under construction. Very ambitious. You say, well, it's much bigger. Not much bigger. About the same size, actually. And for capita income, actually quite comparable. So why are those things not happening here? I think this is really where Columbus is sort of deficient. They're sort of like really deficient in terms of leadership, both in the level of the city and, and certainly in terms of transportation uh, by uh, community leaders, particularly the dispatch. The dispatch has prevented um, uh, transit systems from being explored seriously for really, the, certainly since the 30 years I've been here. When I first got to Columbus, they were putting the kibosh on the idea of rail transit. Um, uh, what a difference that would have made if this were 30 years later of rail transit. Just before, we wouldn't be having this conversation. The whole way things would be built would be so different. So this is really too bad. And we know it's coming eventually. But it'll be so, so much damage will be done by the time it gets here. I mean, things will always get to Columbus eventually. But by the time it does, um, uh, so much damage will be done. It'll be very, very hard to undo. We can't, we can't, we're producing more damage uh, every day. Have you ever been to Delaware County recently? You just cannot believe how much more crap there is up there. Very expensive crap but it's still crap, and it's, well not, it's not crap that will serve the future well. It, it cannot function. <clears throat> yeah, so the unfunny thing about uh, the, the, um, the war, after the war, with all the pro prosperity, lots of things actually became things which architects don't design. So you think of this explosion of program in the 19th century, um, you know, hotels and train stations, and all the things you need for all these expanding cities, post offices and whatnot. We tend not to have those. We we're trying to doing train stations, post offices and whatnot. You don't design post offices anymore. They're just rental things inside strip malls. Uh, department stores. You think of Carson Peary Scott. Would it be great to, well, you're not going to design a department store anymore because they go into the malls. So I just, I just wonder, it's, it's worth thinking how much, how much of what would have been designed is now enclosed in a big box somewhere in this sort of hideous environment. This happens to be Polaris. I hate going there. I hate driving by it. The sort of uh, the re Renaissance travel over the Alps involved drawing the curtains on the coach. You'd want to see the chaos and the disorder. <coughs> I always pull the curtains on my car as I drive past. <laughs> the road is straight enough, there's been no problems yet. <coughs> this is so much investment for something everyone knows is crap. It's just ridiculous. So uh, I, I wish there were an alternative. Oops. And it turns out there is. This is, a, uh, this is the same thing in Japan. It's in Osaka. Uh, this is a shopping mall, an eight-story high thing with a garden on top. A bit denser. I kind of like I much prefer this to Polaris, I have to say. Um, you say, that's Japan. <coughs> it's enough that the um, gross national product per capita in Japan is substantially lower than the USA, and also, they're uh, saveaholics. They don't spend stuff. So it's not as though the shopping malls are making tons of money, people buying stuff. We, we buy a lot more than they do. We have more money than they do, we buy a lot more than they do. So there's no reason we can support things like that. So I don't, it's also, that's, a, that's happened to be a charity, so it's an American design firm doing that. I think you also have to be concerned about this, that increasingly, certainly at the moment, increasingly great opportunities in architecture are not found in this country, they're found overseas. That has to be a, a cause for alarm. 
These are some buildings I like. They're houses. Reminds me of the Wandel House, which I think is really a fabulous little piece of architecture. You haven't seen it. Um, you have to actually get in and have drinks with the Wandels, the view of the city. This sort of, uh, the, you can pretend that you're in LA with a view from the hills through the trees of the city skyline. You ever had that? It's a fabulous, fabulous thing. Um, anyway, I like these buildings. <coughs> this is a Bocce Pavilion. Duluth. <coughs> These are all being produced in Duluth by uh, David Salmela. Uh, this is a town substantially smaller than Columbus. It's a town of decreasing population, of economic stress. And here's an architect who's cranking out pretty interesting houses for, where's the money in Duluth? Car dealerships, guy who owns a McDonald's franchise. I mean, there's <coughs> he's making this happen. So uh, I would love to know how he does that, but it's, it's clearly possible. It's cl clearly possible. The people of Duluth, or it's a, some sort of a Pied Piper uh, music man quality sale, selling these. But I think actually the architecture is not so bad. It's being produced in this hellish little town, I have to say, and a really incredibly inhospitable climate. <clears throat> it's almost Canadian, it's so bad. <clears throat> <laughs> but. Having said that, so this, so after the war, there's an incredible diversion. So we're, we're missing lots of opportunities that we're designing, but the, sort of, uh, the public taste goes south based on development. But there's still interesting things happening. This is one of my favorite houses in Columbus. Uh, it's in Clintonville, and you'll see why. It's not so much the house, but something it does. Here's one facade. This is another. <laughs> you can drive through. <laughs> <laughs> this is a brilliant idea. La later. Um, stolen, really, by a Knowlton professor in his own house. <laughs> what I admire about this is there's a lot of native, I think that people have a sense about space. Um, I think we do it better, but left to their own devices, you get some pretty interesting results, especially we're not doing it. Uh, you get some pretty interesting results. Um, there's all kinds of design in Central Ohio. This is the Hartman Gardens in Springfield. Do you know these? Some people say lunatic, I say visionary. <laughs> <coughs> they are fabulous. Uh, just made out of little pebbles in his backyard. What the hell? So I'm going to do. So I think this, some people, a certain percentage of people have some interest in space, they have interest in, in form, they have interest in coherence and ur urban urbanism. This guy's clearly an urbanist, one of the great Central Ohio urbanists, <laughs> just at a slightly smaller scale. Uh, so also look at the city, um, opportunities missed. I think the uh, Columbus often misses opportunities and presented them. This is one. So uh, it used to be uh, the, uh, the stuff along the river before the big flood was just uh, was industrial. It was just a mess. It was polluted. The flood comes along. Opportunity to do something else. The uh, City Beautiful movement says, why not turn it into a park? It's sort of a wonderful world. So this sort of happens. He's a really great idea. I think the problem is it's just sort of, it's so obviously a better than what was there, but not good enough. And the not good enough ultimately is going to kill it. That the um, sort of this disjuncture of it was never particularly coherent. That there is green space. There's kind of idea of wall it doesn't really work very well. And really, the the killer is Central High School. That the, uh, that the the other side of the river, which is now available for all kinds of development or park, which would be great, a huge central park, is now occupied by this one object. <coughs> Although I have to say, in terms of teenage sensibilities of us against the world, it must have been great for this high school. <laughs> <coughs> so and I think also turning that high school into a 900 foot long wall for the COSI was a really bad idea. I think it's actually not a very good building. I think it's not a particularly good building there, but it's a disaster given where it is. It becomes a, I cannot see the city and I cannot occupy the space with the park because it has to become parking. I would love to get rid of that thing. Um, and really make this into, uh, I think that now the, sea, the, the flood wall is there, there's real opportunity, there could have been real opportunity for this to become one heck of a, a new center for Columbus and a kind of a new room uh, to uh, hold both sides of the river together. So that might happen, I don't know. Well, how the little ideas? I, th I love this thing. <coughs> I love the idea that by building this, A, it connects it to the city, and C, from downtown you look at it and say, it's not that far. I have to admit, before this was built, I would never consider walking 
from High Street to goes uh, to um, uh, whatever it's called. <laughs> <We forgot. laughs> Given the size of that and also the beckoning of it, I, I would, wouldn't hesitate to do it now. So I like that. I like the uh, Pearl Alley and sort of the uh, people tr trying to make it work, whether the city will help them or not. <laughs> ah, don't know what this is all about. This is more, this is more um, uh, Hampstead. Imagine doing this in an Italian village on a vacant lot on an empty block. <laughs> It'd be an outrage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. This is really, this, is, this was going to be my pick of where architects live. This is the Hilliard House. <laughs> my guess is it's not that far from the truth, to be perfectly honest. <clears throat> this is Columbus. I guess the other thing is, uh, I'll try to speed this along. The, uh, we look around us. This happens to be, I think this is um, Newark. It's not bad. <laughs> this is Sullivan Bank, Newark. It's now abandoned again. This is the arcade in Newark. Ha, Bell Fountain. It's the Holland Theater. If you can't get that from the two windmills. This is not <laughs> it's a little kitschy. This is a pretty interesting space. <clears throat> The, uh, the windmills come on and the lights come on in the houses when the, when the feature is over. <laughs> it's, you laugh, but having seen this, this is now someplace you've said, this, this is someplace I wouldn't mind going to. So uh, it's still survived. Uh, so so uh, Bell Fountain. Really great. This is the courthouse. This is stuff in Bell Fountain. This, this is not nothing. The interesting thing is it's not nothing then, but it certainly is nothing now. The idea that there's architectural activity in Bell Fountain is laughable. Uh, this, is, this is Springfield. The amazing city hall in Springfield. A block long and about 40 feet wide. Tower at both ends. City hall, markets, opera house, what the hell. We're, we're seeing it from the current city hall past the Something, it might be a Marriott, some sort of god awful motel. Uh, pretty great fabric, middle of nowhere, pretty great fabric, pretty sizable fabric. Pretty nice thing, rotting. This is their arcade, now gone. It was certainly was here for several years uh, during my residency in Central Ohio. This is the uh, Masonic Hall on the hill. This is the train station. It's, oh. Pretty good. Post office. Newspaper. So uh, S Springfield is cranking out pretty interesting architects, pretty competent architects, putting some really money into it uh, in the uh, early 20th century. And we haven't even started the houses. So this is the Frank Lloyd Wright house. All the stuff along High Street. I mean, there are. There are four buildings by Shepley Bullfinch, the Richardson firm. This is an amazing uh, uh, inventory of housing, amazing inventory of architecture. Haven't even scratched the surface. What about now? Nothing. So you, you have to worry about that. You have to say, well, there's, I think Columbus is a problem, but in fact, you look around and look at all these sort of peripheral towns which are going great guns architecturally, it is, they are dead. They are dead to us. So I'm, my, 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 my fearful analogy is the frog and the hot water. If you put a frog in boiling water, they'll jump out, but if you just sort of gradually increase the heat, they won't. My worry is that as architects, they've just gradually increased the heat, and we're sort of sitting in this hot water. But I think it does not look, the prognosis is not good if we are losing so many opportunities to provide arch architectural opportunities in half Ohio, essentially, to throw anything out in a major city, no architecture, essentially. That's a, that's a bad idea. Uh, <clears throat> going back to Columbus and invention, this is one of my favorite places in Columbus. It's Chefinette. For those of you who haven't been there, this is amazing. <laughs> so, uh, have you guys been here? It's amazing. So, uh, I'm, what are we looking at? We're looking at a wall which is half lattice, half mirror, and half openings into the kitchen. <laughs> so, so uh, you're sitting there and people just appear and then disappear, <laughs> but you don't know if they're in front of you or behind you. <laughs> and 
And you get these amazing transformations where some people, somebody will disappear, some fat lady will disappear, and some skinny guy carrying dishes will appear. <laughs> it's just extraordinary. You can just <clears throat> extraordinary space. So uh, if this were some sort of art installation, it would be brilliant. <clears throat> um, it's just Chefinet. Also, it's great. I took Morris Lapidus here. He was stunned <laughs> at how good it was and how he hadn't thought of this. It also has a. Uh, it's all the original interior, I think it's 1948. It's just George Nelson out the wazoo. So I, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty good thing. There's also another really great thing, which is no longer here, so I've had to kind of recreate it for you. It was the old, uh, it's the old ch char bar. <clears throat> and this is the view you would have gotten on 17th on the campus, looking down towards High Street. So there was a super graphic of blue, red, and white. You say, well, that's really nice. And, the, and there's a, clearly a big O in the red. And you get a little closer to it, and you realize the blue would disappear. It was the Ludovici tile of the roof would disappear. And you realize the O is not an O. It's a C with one serif. Where have you ever seen a C with <laughs> one serif? And obviously the reason is it allows it to become, the, it was the O, and now it's the C. It's that little piece has sort of been moved off. <clears throat> So I think it's sort of this, this, this little rift that you got going between the O of Ohio and the C of the char bar is kind of a great idea. That's very clever. This is the door, or was the door. <clears throat> uh, big brass door handle, clearly made for the door, it's not off the rack. And you pull it, you can see where it's hands, you pull it on the right, all that oily stuff. What's it gonna do? It's gonna turn the, O into a C again. <laughs> I think this is really brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, again, there is there's some sort of native Kunstvolen for <laughs> space and and uh, and uh, graphics making, uh, and we find in the char bar and the chefinet, um, it'd be great to harness that uh, for larger purposes. Um, this is in the very much the same camp, this is the Kahiki. <clears throat> Again, a recreation since it's been blown up. It's now all Walgreens. We didn't realize we didn't have enough Walgreens, but we didn't. <laughs> this was an amazing place for those of you. I mean, if you lived in Columbus long enough, you would have been there. Um, the food was horrible. It was very expensive. <laughs> but you didn't care. And in fact, <laughs> if, you, if you had out-of-town guests, you would take them there. And it was just so brilliant. So this is how you arrive. It's on uh, East Main. You arrive from town, we're the arrow, and the, you can't enter it, you have to drive past it. And you're driving past, there was this fairly wacko garden, vaguely oriental, if you weren't too picky, but what that might mean. <laughs> <laughs> so you have, it's all East Main, so it's a, sort of a palate cleanser. You drive past it. <laughs> <laughs> you drive past it, and you drive into it, and drive back through it. And so the, this is really brilliant. A, to have it, it's beyond where you want to go, you have to go there, so you've experienced once, and now you've paid the money for that, you now drive through it, this is a freebie. So you've essentially doubled the length of garden you're driving through, and changed the from going past to going into. I think it's just a brilliant idea. It was originally a valet, so you then drop the car off in front of the building, it will disappear into this sort of hellish parking lot in the back, you never see it, it will then magically reappear through the fernery <coughs> when you leave. Uh, and you look at the, uh, so I think the, the site plan is just brilliant. Um, this is what it is. I think flaming tiki heads are never a miss. <laughs> <coughs> also notice the little pavilion in front to kind of, and the sign to block the view into the suburban hell around. It was really very cleverly designed. You're really you're changing uh, the, where, where you are. This is the typical interior. There are lots of parties, people having fun. This was, the, uh, this was the place to be. It was also the place to go to. So there's a, there's a um, picture. It used to be in the, in the uh, bar, they would have a picture of all the celebrities who had been there, and they were just solid celebrities up until about the late 60s, and yeah. it just sort of died. It became not so fashionable. But also, um, that's sort of too bad. But also sort of harks back to a time where where you were made a difference, or where something was happening made a difference, as opposed to you know, I can remember listening on the radio in the morning uh, when, I was, when I was sick, when I was a little boy, high atop the Hotel Allerton in downtown Chicago. I said, well, that, this is, this is someplace. This is happening. Whereas now, <coughs> no idea. It's, it's sort of this placelessness of event 
um, that just makes no, this can't be a good thing if you're a placemaker. Anyway, this is the arrival of the Kahiki. This is part of the uh, driveway. You're not coming through the garden. It would be lit up at night. <coughs> we get out of the pup mobile. We go through the uh, tiki gods. And then sort of inside was actually not a room. It was a world of all these various villages. So you had, uh, and each one was incredibly cool. So you just, you just think, well, you could, and you had to go to just one. So you think, You'd wander around and say, the next time I'll go to another one. So what a brilliant idea this is. You go back at least seven times just to experience all the worlds. I think this is not something you'd say at you know, Rigsby's or Applebee's. It just doesn't happen that way. So, uh, and my favorite world was the jungle, which is, doesn't look like much here. It's that far wall. <clears throat> you would sit at a little table. There would be a window. The window is into a, essentially a conservatory. There would be little birds pecking away. There would be plants. There would be a thunder, fake thunder. There'd be fake lightning, and it would rain. The cycle would go through every 15 minutes. <laughs> it was mesmerizing. <laughs> you wonder what the little birds felt, because clearly that was their world. They lived in a world where it rained every 15 minutes. <laughs> um, clearly, the garden is a feature. You find all sorts of web pictures of people being photographed in the garden. <laughs> uh, and this is the center axis. This is a brilliant, I, not that it's ever existed in anywhere in the South Pacific, but there's this thing, a fabulous thing, like a cross between a, I don't know what it is, sort of a baboon. <laughs> I'm always reminded of that fabulous thing of the uh, hotel in the, the Sherry Netherlands in Cincinnati, that incredible thing at the end of the axis of the dining room. This is another version, I guess. I love the little sort of baboon eyes. I love the roaring fireplace. This, I think it was called the village. Uh, this is some of the people who had been there. You're probably way too young to remember any of these. I remember recognize Arthur Godfrey and Milton Berle, and uh, basically every slightly B-list personality uh, would have been there. But it would have, would have been an important place to be. I don't know where that is now in Columbus. I don't know if Milton Berle would have come here. I don't know where he would want to go. That would be you go to a restaurant. I don't know. It wouldn't be any different than any place else. I mean, they would go to G. Michael's or Rigsby's. Perfectly nice. Um, this was unique. It was a unique experience. Uh, this is some, some idea of it in its later days. The sort of things are sort of deteriorating, but you get the sort of scale of it. And clearly, even deteriorating was quite popular. Oddly enough, the restaurant is gone, but the god-awful food survives. <laughs> How is that possible? <laughs> well, that's Columbus. <laughs> we make poor decisions. <clears throat> okay, this is what we're wrapping up now. So. Uh, here are a few of my favorite buildings. They're starting fairly lowbrow. This is um, this is the uh, cattle barn at the Lancaster uh, Fairgrounds, the Fairfield County Fair. I think this is an unbelievable building. It's hard to photograph, and I don't want to. Really, it's now the fairground. The fair is beginning on Sunday, so I don't want to have the, show you the interiors. So you have to rather you go see them, but I will draw them for you. So what I need is in a cattle barn. I need a, I need a space where the animals can't be pinned and therefore frightened. I cannot have a corner. So that means it's going to have to be round. Um, I'm going to need seating going from that, so it means I can have sort of an a, um, amphitheater seating around that. I have to have a roof to cover that, so I now have this sort of intersecting cone going the other way. And very quickly, it's just a series of rational decisions. You end up looking like it's a collaboration between Aldo Rossi and Palladio. <laughs> which wouldn't have been such a bad idea, it turns out. <laughs> so I now have this. I now have to, there has to be a walkway down to below, which I have to enclose. There's another, a whole other ring around that, right now under that. And I need service buildings. So I need some place where the cattle will actually be. So I have to have, I also need entrances. I'll let those work together. So I provide cross axes, put the entrances in them, the entrances in the, into the actual uh, amphitheater. And then off of those, I'll then extend these cattle barns. So this is it. This is the building. And the, I find it just unbelievably beautiful. There's another little thing which we have to go. There's a special emergency chute exit, which I think is no longer legal. But it looks like a, lo looks like a lot of I would, in a case of a fire, I'm going down that baby. You go out the top and sort of very, very fast slide down the side. It makes sense to me. <coughs> Works on a plane. I don't know why it would work in a building. The other really incredible building there, I think the cattle barn is really unbelievable. The other one is with arts and crafts. So it's very similar to the cattle barn. You have these two arms, which are rather banal. Uh, they intersect to make it really sort of a Palladian or centralized building. And they do it in a, what's amazing about it is they do it by having a, the intersection creates a negative temple front. So where I would expect a facade is actually a void. 
I get the column, the columns and the lintel, but there's actually nothing there. This is an amazing space. And I also like the way then it's uh, manipulated. It, it's, this is occurring really in the wrong part of the site. They cannot expand, so the arms have to fold around uh, back on themselves. So um, here's the overall view. That's the, there's the arts and crafts to the right. You can see the way they're sort of pushed together. So actually two of the arms become twins uh, up there. Uh, the cattle barn is over here. This is really one amazing, I think, uh, one amazing site. The Aldo Rossi horse barns are those incredibly long bars uh, to the uh, north part of the site. Also, the landscape is amazing. This is where the Appalachians again. It was a limestone or a sandstone cliff at the south end of it. You can see Columbus in the back uh, in the distance. Uh, other nice things that uh, I really like in Central Ohio architecture this is the Harding Memorial in Marion. Again, Marion. Architecture. It used to be yes, now it's not. So uh, people still live there, still have space. That seems a problem. So uh, if you approach, this is what you see. Starts to open. And it's beautiful. It's kind of a Mosler safe uh, aspect of this. So this seal piece reveals its treasures. There's an amazing discussion as these things rotate with each other, you almost expect to let the tossed uh, aerosol and it will be actually rotating huge like rollers and it's sort of this illusion. I love that juncture between those two pieces to see them sliding past each other. I think it's really quite good. Oh, this, is, this is the inside of the cattle bar, or the uh, arts and crafts. Uh, so to the south, you get 
chunks of space broken and fragmented for a very accommodative sort of grid. It's not unlike uh, for a piece of the city or a piece of a campus. I'm going to find squares and streets and buildings to the north. I really just get wall. So on the north side, we're going to have city wall. On the south side, I'm in the city. There's like a half of a geo, the sigma geo. The inside is fragmented and, and uh, connectable. The upper part is a perimeter and not connected. <coughs> so like the old, so the north side, I have the forest. For the old side, and the south, I have the city. Thank you. 
Yeah, it's a, <coughs> sorry if it was a 